you'll notice that uh, our title is part of the first verse of Hebrews 11. The authorised version gives it a little differently. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The revised version, or revised standard version of 1952, an American version, is similar. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The Good News Bible of 1966 gives it this way. To have faith is to be sure of the things we hope for, to be certain of the things we cannot see. <coughs> More recent versions may be even closer to the title we use here. But the difference in meaning is insignificant. Thus we propose to examine the meaning of the words shown in the authorised version, the King James Version to our transatlantic cousins, because this is the version with which I'm most familiar, I grew up with it, so I use it mostly most days. And besides that, it has the ring of Shakespeare about it. <coughs> we'll look at the principal words first of all, in the English, and then in the Greek. So faith, what is faith? It's defined in my Oxford Dictionary as, first of all, complete trust or confidence. Secondly, firm belief, especially without logical proof. Thirdly, religious belief. And fourthly, duty or commitment to fulfil a trust or a promise. And things like that. That's faith. Substance is it's the essential material forming a thing. A particular kind of material having uniform properties. A reali reality, solidity, seriousness, steadiness of character, a theme or a subject of a work of art, or argument and so on, a real meaning or essence of a thing, wealth or possessions, the essential nature underlying phenomenon, subject to changes of course and accidents, and finally drugs or narcotics. And the third one, evidence, the available facts, circumstances and so on, indicating whether or not a thing is true or valid. Law, information tending to prove a fact or proposition. Statements or proofs admissible as testimony in a law court. And finally, clearness or obviousness. Now all of these definitions come from the Oxford Dictionary. And you'll have seen that in some cases they are more than a definition. They are examples of the words in use. <coughs> so let's have a look at the Greek. <coughs> In Greek, the word faith occurs 243 times as the word pistis, P-I-S-T-S, P-I-S-T-I-S. That's in the New Testament. That's 237 times, rather, 243 in total. Of the remaining six, five are associated with the word pistis, oligopistis, and the last one, the odd one out, is mistranslated as faith, instead of hope because it's the Hebrew it's the Greek word elpis so mainly it's this word pistis or similar so what does it mean Vine in his expositionary dictionary of New Testament words gives it primarily a firm persuasion and conviction based upon evidence facts and so on and he says it's akin to another word pitho p-e-i-t-x-o to persuade. And he goes on to say it is used in the New Testament always, always of faith in God or Christ or things spiritual. Later on he says that the main element in faith in its relation to the invisible God as distinct from faith in man the main element of that are a firm conviction producing a full acknowledgement of God's revelation or truth substance the Greek word is hypostasis and Vine says that here in Hebrews 11 one, it has the meaning of confidence or assurance and evidence the Greek is elegkos e-l-e-g-c-h-o-s meaning proof conviction and it comes from a similar word not quite the same but similar elegcho e-l-e-g-c-h-o meaning to confute, to admonish, and amongst its subsidiary meanings is to convict or convince. So let's put all these together from the essential meanings in English and then in its Greek counterpart. 
faith is to have complete trust or confidence in the things for which we hope and it is the understanding of the facts revealed by God that shows that these things are true and valid and you'll see we paraphrase the first verse of Hebrews 11 the authorised version that is using the definitions of English that we take from the dictionary now using the Greek we have faith is to have a firm persuasion or conviction and assurance that what God has promised will happen and our conviction springs from what God has revealed now the verse itself is easy enough to understand and its importance is emphasised in verse 6 of the same chapter we read it the last part of our reading but without faith it is impossible to please him that is God for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him two things there belief that he exists and belief that following him we get a reward <coughs> the chapter continues by giving a long list of men and women regarded by God as faithful beginning with righteous Abel the second born son of Adam and Eve now we'll look at the things that believers are to hope for in a little while we used to consider for some time some of the outstanding characters shown in this chapter first what did Abel do which pleased the eternal creator the record is in Genesis 4 we're not going to turn to it but we'll refer to it where we can read of how Cain and Abel his older brother both brought offerings before God Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and verse 2 of Genesis 4 tells us that Abel kept sheep we also learn that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground he was a farmer a horticulturist he grew things out of the ground Abel's offering was accepted by the eternal deity whilst Cain's was rejected now to the uninstructed human mind the rejection of one and the acceptance of the other seems arbitrary each brother had offered that for which they had laboured they worked to produce it one way or another why then should such a striking distinction be made between them Bible readers however appreciate that the supreme deity does not act capriciously he does not turn away from those who whilst wishing to serve him act wrongly out of ignorance we can find examples of that but we won't because our time is limited in such cases he will make an allowance for the ignorance he will not count such as being righteous he can't do that but there is an aspect of mercy shown to them this is seen in regards to the way Cain was dealt with in this matter of wrong offering <coughs> he was reminded that what his brother had bought brought rather had been accepted and that if he did likewise he too would be accepted it was all a matter of the intention what Abel offered reflected the situation which Adam and Eve had brought about with their disobedience they had brought sin and death into being sin being disobedience and despite sowing fig leaves together they had been unable to cover their sins their sin singular the slaying of animals thus shedding their blood had been undertaken by God and the resultant skins then used to cover their nakedness their sin that was so God would not gaze upon it they were covered covered by what he provided this covering besides being utilitarian was also prophetic it was pointing forward to the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ who by his life of perfect obedience never once sinning even to accepting a cruel and humiliating death upon a stake nailed to a stake that was a perfect sacrifice for sin allowing the eternal deity to set aside the sentence of death that it originally enacted upon Adam and Eve not just for the Lord Jesus Christ but for all those who truly believe in him and act accordingly and God could do that without any compromise of his divine justice and righteousness now by bringing of his flock Abel identified himself with what Adam and Eve had done <coughs> he acknowledged that he was like them he was sinful disobedient like them he acknowledged also or identified also that what had been done for them in the provision of covering was being done for him 
and what was to be done by the eternal death in due time by the provision of his son. In other words, Abel understood what it was all about and he showed by his actions that he wanted to be associated with all of these things and that pleased the eternal deity. By contrast, Cain did not appreciate what was happening. He didn't appreciate what the sacrifice was about and instead brought what he thought was appropriate. Religious, yes, but on his own terms and thus he was rejected. Offering fruit and vegetables in different circumstances would have been acceptable but not in relation to the covering of human sin. The outcome was that Cain afterwards killed Abel. The man whom his mother Eva thought was the one, this is Cain, the one to put right that which she and Adam had got wrong, verse 1 of chapter 4 of Genesis tells us that, he turned out to be the first murderer, the first fratricide. But Abel, although removed from the scene of human affairs, for the time being, nevertheless had given a powerful example of righteous obedience which has been kept on record for the best part of 6,000 years. Now as we look through this 11th chapter of Hebrews, we know many people of great faith, we say no referred to, who warned of God that a great flood was coming at a time when it wasn't raining upon the earth, the earth was watered by a heavy dew in the morning, a mist and so on, but it's going to rain, has said God. A great flood's coming as a consequence, not only rain, but the the deeps underneath the earth had been had broken out as well. He was warned. And he was told that this flood would destroy all breathing things from off the earth, ignoring fish, of course, and things like that. But all the things that depended upon air above the water were going to be blotted out. And he was told he would build an ark according to a divine specification. 450 feet long by 75 feet wide by 45 feet high a truly massive structure and this took about 100 years to build we have no doubt he was helped by his sons and maybe their wives maybe his own wife as well long though the labour had been this ark meant that Noah and his family alone of all the people on the earth eight people were preserved from the flood along with a host of pairs of animals to start refilling the earth again with life once more. And we know just a little aside that when, I, when Noah went into the ark with all his family and all the animals were in, God shut the door. It wasn't that, that Noah was being difficult, God shut him in. And he shut him in so that those who would not believe outside would drown. We read of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and their wives who were all obedient to the commands that they received from the eternal deity. In the case of Abraham and Sarah, to the extent of abandoning a settled life in the populous and advanced city of Ur of the Chaldees, where they were probably people of some substance. They left all that behind when Abraham received the call, and they became nomads, living in tents, as we said of Moses this morning, with their flocks and so on. <coughs> we read of Joseph, who became the second ruler of Egypt under Pharaoh. We read of Moses, who was brought up as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, of Rahab, a Canaanite as it seems, who delivered the spies sent into Jericho by Joshua from the hands of those sent to arrest them. We read of David, who became Israel's greatest king, greatest in achievements, not in glory, in splendor, that was Solomon, but in achievements, that was David and a man of great faith and belief, despite his failings from time to time. Many others are mentioned in this chapter, at least six others by name, and further ones by reference to events involving them. So when reading this chapter with discernment, we see the same thread repeated again and again. These men and women, demonstrated by the way they behaved, especially in relation to their obedience to divine instructions, that they had a confident assurance that God will, would fulfill his promises to them, often in the short term of their then lives, but always in respect of his promises regarding an eternal future. This is to say that sometimes these men and women of great faith were faced with difficult and daunting circumstances which God's promises had indicated from which they would be delivered. 
where this was the case, the deliverance always happened. But glad though the men and women were for deliverance in this way, in this life, this was not the vital focus of their faith and belief. That focus was on the future life yet to be experienced, although of course it's actually experienced now by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now you might be wondering how we make this out. Well this is simple really. If we look at the last two verses of Hebrews 11, we can read them and we read this. These are fascinating words. And I've turned back to Hebrews from Jeremiah. They're not just fascinating, they're powerful as well. And they convey meanings which often transcend our thoughts. Having referred to the list of all the ones going through the chapter, the writer, the Apostle Paul, says, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. That's fantastic, isn't it? They faithfully obeyed him. And although God had promised more than one thing to those who faithfully obeyed him, one promise above all the others was the most vital in importance. That promise was that of an endless life. That is a life of immortality. Not just keep living, but living in a perfected form as well, without any of the inhibitions we now have and the infirmities we now have. Being made absolutely incapable of dying or of wearying and so on, as indeed the Lord Jesus Christ is now. So in this passage we can see the marvellous balance which the eternal deity has arranged in this matter. The divine purpose is and always has been to fill the earth with his glory and alongside that to have that glory known and upheld by a race of deathless men and women. Men and women called out of the nature which they inherited from Adam and from Eve. That's the import of Numbers 14 verse 21. As truly as I live, said Yahweh to Moses, all the earth will be full of my glory. He says similar but in a slightly different way in Isaiah 11 and in Habakkuk 2 verse 14. Both of those make reference, make reference to the glory filling the earth like the waters cover the sea. Now the failure to obey by Adam and Eve, although it marred the divine intention, it did not wreck God's purpose. It simply challenged that fulfilment through the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in God's mind from the beginning, and his purpose was channeled through him to open out to all those who believe in him. The Lord Jesus became the central feature of the fulfilment of the divine purpose by his perfect obedience, even to the suffering of crucifixion. God could raise him from the dead because he had done nothing deserving of death, as a punishment for sin. Indeed, he could only suffer death, he could only die, as a consequence of the sin nature he bore from Mary, inherited all the way back to Adam and Eve. Having that same sin nature permitted him to die. It caused his death, you can say. But having never committed any sin, it allowed God to raise him to life again without doing any despite to his own perfect justice and righteousness. How so? Simple, simple really again death was pronounced upon Adam and Eve because of their disobeying of the divine instruction not to eat of the tree of knowledge the tree of knowledge of good and evil they had been warned of this sentence previously if you disobey then this is what will happen to you and this disobedience not only brought death in, its, in due course it also brought about an adjustment to their natures in that afterwards they became creatures who were prone to disobey. They could scarcely avoid disobeying, not all the time, but ultimately. Despite having that nature, the Lord Jesus Christ never disobeyed his Father. Always he placed his Father's will above his own. Now this led him into conflict with the leaders of his nation from time to time and led him ultimately to the stake. All of this was foreknown to the eternal deity and at some time during Christ's life, it was understood to be the case by the Lord Jesus. But he kept steadfastly to the fulfilling of the divine will. 
Thus he had done nothing worthy of death, nothing which required that penalty to be imposed. So having died by reason of having a death-stricken nature, and not for personal sin or disobedience, it was perfectly proper, it was just, it was right, that the eternal deity should bring him out of death. And later on, to elevate him to the divine nature. Only a few days later, maybe hours later. And in doing so, God kept strictly to his own rules, laid down from the, from the beginning of our race. Essentially, these were disobey and die, on the one hand, and on the other hand, obey and live. But significant though this is, there is something greater involved. Because the Lord Jesus Christ was perfectly obedient, vindicating his Father in, in being so, God could then choose him as the vehicle through which men and women could approach him seeking forgiveness and salvation. There's an echo here of, of Abel and Cain. Abel knew what was required of him by way of sacrifice, and both what the sacrifice memorialised, that is his, his parents' disobedience, and what it pointed forward to, that is the sacrificial life and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. These things were vitally important to Abel, hence his obedience. But they meant nothing to Cain, which is the case for most men and women, and always has been. Not for all, but for most. Abel had faith in his God, and would fulfil the promise he had made, that is God rather, would fulfil the promise made in Genesis 3.15, where the Lord Jesus Christ is shown in prospect. The seed of the woman, the seed of the woman which having had his own heel damaged by the serpent's seed, would damage the serpent's seed in the head. And that's a killing blow. And at that time, Abel's faith brought about his death at the hand of his brother, to whom the things of God meant nothing. Abel, however, had complete trust and confidence in God. And in consequence, he obtained witness that he was righteous. Paul makes this very clear in Hebrews 11, verse 4. Simple, really. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet speaketh, he speaks by example. We can read of his example and be instructed by it. Abel's righteousness came from the eternal deity. It was grafted upon him. It wasn't his own perfectness. Righteousness came from God. The same sort of situation faced Enoch and his faith was such that God translated him, he removed him from the scene of human affairs, that he should not see death. A scene before his contemporaries began to die. So before they began to die, Enoch was moved out of the way. And a review of all those featured in Hebrews 11 shows that they were all waiting to receive the promise. They may well have benefited from other promises during their mortal lives, nor in his family delivered from from the flood, for example, Abraham and Sarah given the son they longed for, despite their advancing years, Gideon and Barak triumphant over the enemies of their people, Jephthah and Samson also triumphant in the same way, David delivered from the hand of Goliath, and later on from the bitter jealousy of King Saul, whom he had served faithfully. All of these events, and others also, were important to these men and women, and we can read of how these matters were greatly appreciated. But transcending all of these things, in the minds of these faithful men and women, the supreme focus was on the fact that in due time, the eternal deity would rectify the problems of sin and all its ramifications for all those of our race who look to him for salvation. That was what they hoped for. That was what they yearned for. And all that they learned, either from the prophets of the eternal deity or sometimes directly from him through the agency of an angel, all of those things gave them abundant reason to be sure of what they hoped for, that they knew what it was and they knew it would be fulfilled. Listen to what Job has to say in Job 19, verses 25 to 27. Job, living round about 1700 BC, a faithful man, a man who was a great believer, who went through terrible trials, partly through the jealousy of somebody referred to as Satan, whom I believe was one or more of his friends, nevertheless retained his belief in the mercy of the deity. And he says in chapter 19, 
verses 25 to 27, these things. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall, he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. So that was what Job hoped for. He knew that God had planned for a Redeemer to come. He knew that that Redeemer would stand in the latter days upon the earth. And that even though he, Job, might be dead and buried for many, many years, nevertheless, in due time, he would see this Redeemer with his own eyes. That was Job's great hope and expectation. It is still awaiting fulfilment. He's been dead, what, over three and a half thousand years now. But it's still waiting for them. David expresses the same sort of hope in Psalm 17 and verse 15. David, you know, was the great psalmist of Israel and he had deep understanding of the things of God. He may have failed from time to time, as all men do, but he kept that understanding in his heart and he looked for salvation in due time. And in verse 15 of Psalm 17 he has this to say as for me I will look, behold thy face in righteousness I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness so David also knew as Job did that even though he rested in the, in the earth the dust of the earth for many generations nevertheless in due time he'd be brought back to see the salvation that God had provided this psalm follows the one, the previous one, in which David reveals things about the Messiah. It's one of a group of Masonic psalms, as, as verses 8 to them so clearly. Indeed, Psalm 8 is quoted in Acts 2, verses 25 to 28. There, Peter is, is demonstrating the essential truths about Jesus Christ. This name means Saviour anointed, the man specifically provided by the eternal Creator to save men and women from sin and death. Messiah means anointed or the anointed one. It was not that Israel as a nation, as a people, did not know about a Messiah, simply that, that all the prophetic facts about him, his sacrificial lamb, being a sacrificial lamb, was not recognised or understood. They had other things in mind. And we can see by looking at the Gospel records that even those men selected by the Lord Jesus Christ to be his apostles, those who were close to him, those who were sent forth to be preach the gospel to, to those round about, even those people, close, close enough to be sat shoulder to shoulder with uh, meals and so on, nevertheless did not understand the sacrificial role which Jesus had to be had to fulfil. He told them out from time to time, sometimes in graphic detail, but at that time their minds were full of what the Lord Jesus would do to deliver Israel from foreign oppressors. That was what focused their minds, what he was going to do to the Romans and anybody else for that matter. That will happen in due time. But that wasn't the first part of the purpose. Therefore, when he revealed the other side of his mission, they failed to realise as to what he was referring. His death and resurrection opened their eyes. We can think of the two disciples going home from Jerusalem to Emmaus, about seven or eight miles away, on the third day after the crucifixion, when they were joined by a man who seemed to be a stranger. And they spoke to him. That, what's, what, why are you getting downcast? Well, don't you know what's been happening? And he told them, they told him of what things had happened and how Jesus Christ, in whom they trusted as a prophet and so on, he's the one who's going to redeem Israel. He'd been killed. And it's the third day and he's still not risen. So they thought. And then they invited him to their house to have a meal when they got there. And during the course of the meal, he broke the bread and gave a prayer for him. That, it clicked, and they recognised who he was at that point. But he vanished out of their sight. Now, he previously challenged them by stating, O oh fools, O oh dullards, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, after which he went through the scriptures, beginning at Moses, and all the prophets expounding the things concerning himself. And so powerful was his exposition of what the prophets and Moses had revealed that later on they remarked that their hearts burned within them 
as he gave them this instruction and then he disappeared it's the Lord so they gathered things and they went back the eight miles had come to tell their friends and fellow believers in Jerusalem that Jesus had appeared to them now at Pentecost we're back in Acts 2 Peter was driving home the same facts about the Lord Jesus Christ to his Jewish listeners as he made it known to them that the Lord Jesus Christ was their long-awaited Messiah. He was the one who would take away sin and bring salvation to light. He made it plain that David had understood what God had promised that he would provide. God had said he would provide one who would sit upon David's own throne as Lord and Christ our Messiah. Now that message shattered those who heard it. It's in Acts chapter 2 verse 37. They've just been told that they, they were complicit, ignorantly maybe, in the death of the Messiah. And they said to Peter and to the others, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The reply was, Repent and be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The essence of the most important of the promises given by God is essentially this. Forgiveness of sins, and through that, the granting of eternal life. Abraham, we know, received several promises from the eternal deity. They're shown first in, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 7. We can see that he was promised a land, that he would become a great nation, that he would be blessed and have a great name, that he would be a blessing, and that in him would all the families of the earth be blessed. All the families of the earth. Not just the Jews, but others as well. The land he was to receive would be to given to him in his seed forever, in chapter 14. Isaac received the same promises in chapter 26, as did Jacob some years later in chapter 20, all in Genesis. But note how in each case there is a reference to the general blessing upon mankind through them and their seed. And Galatians 3 verse 16 makes it abundantly clear that this promised seed promised first to Abraham in specific terms and then to Isaac and Jacob is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. History shows that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob did have many descendants, millions in total. But the seed through whom the blessing would come was a singular one. One seed, one descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ. Through this one seed would all the families of the earth be blessed. Now that's not a proclamation of universal salvation, but it is a declaration that any man or woman who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ as revealed in Scripture and tries to live by following his example can be reconciled to God regardless of origin, be they Semitic or Hamitic or Japhatic, that is, be they of Eastern, African or European origin, or Indo-European. To the religious of the time of Christ and his apostles, such a teaching struck at their sense of superior exclusiveness and caused much conflict. But a true reflection on their history would have reminded them that God had always made provision for Gentiles to be associated with Israel on appropriate conditions. What he promised wasn't confined to Israel. Anybody joining and believing the same things could come in and be counted as part of Israel even though they were born many, many miles away from totally different tribes. We think now of King David. They should remember that David, their greatest king, was the product of a union between Israelite man and Gentile women. Rahab of Jericho, probably a Canaanite, married Salmon, a prince of Judah, and their union begat Boaz. He in turn wed Ruth, a Moabitess, who bore him Obed, the father of Jesse, who in turn fathered David. So in, in David's immediate descent there were two women who were Gentiles. The Jews should have known this and realised that origin was not as important as they made it appear. It had advantages but it wasn't exclusive. All of those listening in Hebrews 11 had the same hope. Reconciliation to the eternal deity through the sacrifice which he had provided. Forgiveness of sins through that reconciliation. And salvation in consequence, namely the granting of eternal life. Much more than that but that's a shorthand description of it. They knew what they believed, they knew why they believed it, and they trusted the evidence they had before them, and they were sure of what it was they hoped for. 
They knew that the eternal deity had a firm purpose to fill the earth with his glory. They knew that that purpose included having his glory shared by a a race of deathless men and women, reclaimed, (coughs) brought back from the sin-stricken subjection to death, set in motion by Adam and Eve years before. And they knew that the agent of this marvellous situation would be the Lord Jesus Christ. They could see him in prospect hundreds of years before his birth. The Lord Jesus said in John 8, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. That was 1700 or so years before. Abraham saw it in prospect and he was glad at the prospect. David wrote, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Now that is the core of what they, and we with them, hope for. The direct ruling of this earth, this globe, by the eternal creator, initially through the physical agency of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as King Jesus, ruling from Jerusalem on the throne which centuries ago was occupied by his illustrious ancestor, King David. There are many other things associated with this promise, and a little investigation will show that when the earth is physically and visibly ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ, King Jesus, the inhabitants of the earth will experience a time of unparalleled blessings. War will cease. It won't even be learned. There will no longer be able men and women training at the various military academies through the world. That's gone. Food will be plentiful. Length of life will be increased tremendously as, a, as health is greatly improved. Crime will be eliminated and righteousness will fill the earth. Doing the right things for the right reasons. That's a simple description of righteousness. Men and women will be able to dwell in peace and join the work of their hands, a work which will be no longer the grind it is now, but after the fashion of a king gardener, relishing what he or she does because of the sheer delight of seeing things grow due to their efforts. And the curse which makes much of the tasks associated with both agriculture and horticulture so tedious and tiresome at present that same curse which is specified in Genesis 3 verses 17 to 18 as part of the punishment inflicted for disobedience upon Adam and Eve that curse will have been removed and in consequence not only will the work needed to tend that which has been planted be substantially reduced the earth's fertility will be concentrated upon producing food rather than sustaining weeds now this sort of life was what all those named are referred to in Hebrews 11 and many others are sent out but not, yet, not there referred to. It's what they hoped for. And it was that hope which sustained them throughout their lives. And it is the same hope which can sustain believers now. Especially now as they can see through the words of Bible prophecy that the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ is very close indeed. Not gentle Jesus meek and mild but the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lion of the tribe of Judah spoken of in Revelation. And you realise that so perfect is the balance which God has set up in these things that these remarkable men and women listed in Hebrews 11 with such tremendous testimonies from the eternal deity recorded for thousands of years have not yet received the blessing promised. We saw in Hebrews 11 that despite their good report through faith these have not received the promise. Why? God having provided some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So all the thousands, maybe millions of faithful men and women from days gone are still awaiting, still asleep, unconscious in the ground, awaiting their call to be made perfect. And the balance is supplied in 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 15 to 18, where we can read how that the fact that some believers will still be alive when the Lord Jesus comes will not disadvantage those who are asleep, those who are dead. Why not? Because the first thing that the Lord Jesus will do is to raise all those men and women who are responsible to his judgment seat. They are to be brought to life again and gathered together with the believers who are still alive at that time into one great assembly before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we believe. This is what we are sure of. And this is our hope. If you wish to share such a vibrant and well-attested Bible hope, then we will be pleased to discuss these things with you in due time, either now or 
some time later on. Thank you.